Youssef, thank you for flying out here from Atlanta to help us close down Players Tech. It's, it's great to have you here. That was a clip from the amazing Netflix miniseries, When They See Us by Ava DuVernay. 25 million viewers. Uh, you were interviewed by Oprah Winfrey. Here you are at Players Tech. Uh, why? Th there have been documentaries and books yes. about the Exonerated Five before the events of, of 1989. You spent almost seven years in prison. But this thing is, is resonating. Why, why are we having this discussion now, do you think? I think the reach that Netflix has in terms of its global presence really changed the game. I mean, it's the, this, this is a, a ripple effect around the globe. As it was coming, I kept saying to people, there's going to be an astronomical event. The whole globe is about to be hit on the 31st of May. And they'll all at one time be able to see this great piece of work that we've been wanting everyone to see. The documentary was a tremendous piece of work in that it gave us our voices back. It gave us an opportunity for folks to be able to sit down for two hours to be able to really get what it is that the Central Park Five went through from their own voices. The thing that we had hoped for was there to be some type of a feature or something like that, which would allow people, because sometimes I, I step out on stage like this all the time, right? And so there's a disconnect sometimes as young people look at me and they're saying to themselves, this guy went to prison? You know? Um, but one of the things that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to impress upon them, because just like I went to prison, I got a college degree. And I don't say that to impress them, but I try to impress upon them that if I had gone through that horrific time, you too can do something great. And so I wanted the film in this series to be able to bridge that, that divide where young people are able to see themselves as that could be me. Because that's the type of seeds that I wanted to plant. I wanted people to understand that they had the power in themselves to overcome this type of horror. I'm a little surprised to hear, hear you kind of attribute some of the success of the, of the miniseries to Netflix, like the, to the power of the platform. Is it, is it maybe too hopeful to think that there's a cultural reason too that perhaps we're ready to, to really contend with the ugliness of the, of the episode? So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that happened. I think we're talking about 30 years of trauma that they tried to sweep under the rug. They tried to press into the ground. They tried to disappear. And the reality of the matter is that here it is 30 years later, we're growing up as if we were weeds, you know. They threw us in the dirt and we were diamonds in the dirt, but they picked us up, we still were diamonds. We still had that same resilience, that same, pro that same power. Um, the part that I think is brilliant is the curiosity. This, this story has been murky ever since its inception. And I say that because they had things like this. They would, they would pop out these huge headlines. I mean, over 400 articles were written about us within the, within the first few weeks. And they had these huge headlines that said things like DNA evidence. And if you, were, if you weren't watching the papers the next day, when the DNA evidence didn't match, you didn't know. All you remembered was that there was something about DNA in this case. And so you had Donald Trump and other, po other folks chime in early on. This was prior to us even being even going to court, right? I mean, like the trial hadn't started. Two weeks in, Donald Trump paid for ad space in New York City's newspapers, calling for the state to kill us. That was tantamount, as Corey Wise said, as he, he said, Donald Trump put a bounty on my head. And for those of us that have seen the series, I think it's tremendous in that part four really paints the picture of how devastatingly terrible it was to rush to judge the Central Park Five, formerly, formerly known as Central Park Five, now, now known as the Exonerated Five. You brought up our, our president. Not only did he take those ads out back in 1989, but he has recently incredibly doubled down on the sentiment. He, he refuses to apologize. And he has said, well, they, they admitted their guilt of something. How, how do you feel about that? So Donald Trump, to me, represents an idea. And I want to I share this letter with you because this letter kind of paints a picture of why Donald Trump would say something like that. This is an actual letter that was sent to me. It was sent to all of us, actually. Similar letters like this sent to all of us. But this letter I share with individuals because I want people to understand what's really going on here. This letter says to Yusuf Salam, this letter is to let you know that your name has been placed on the list of enemies of society 
by the Citizens Army New York City branch. You made a decision when you became one of the pack that decided to attack and violate honest citizens who happened to be in the park. Now this is the part that I think is really interesting. It says, so just remember that even 20 to 30 years from now, some people will never forget. And maybe the one time that you don't check your back is the one time that somebody might just be there to say hello. The idea that the criminal system of injustice is infallible, is wrong. Black and brown folks have had the oppressor's foot on our necks since the so-called emancipation or the so-called freeing of the slavery, the abolishment of slavery. But then they threw that clause in as a part of the founding documents of this country within the 13th Amendment, which clearly states that if you happen to get arrested, we can turn you back to a state of slavery. Now, anybody can read that. But I submit that when black and brown folks read that, they're talking about our ancestors. They're talking about a horrible thing that happened in the American history that we all want to be able to say, we need reparations. But they say to us, come on, y'all got to just forget about it. That's, we, we, we passed that. Not when you see what appears to be slave catchers running and catching folks and shooting us down, trying to get return property back to where. You know, I live in the South now, right? And it always is um, a fearful kind of reality when you see things like Charlottesville happen. And people are, they're, they're out there uh, protesting and saying, states' rights, states' rights. Now, what's the rest of the piece? States' rights to what? States' rights to own people. And so therefore, you got the privatization of prisons. You got the overwhelming majority of the population of the people in prison being black and brown folks. You got this reality where even myself, just like a colleague Browder, was they were trying to extinguish our light. Here we were 14, 15, and 16-year-old children. And I think that that's the part that people need to remember and, and, and have impressed upon them. We hadn't even began life yet. Here we are, the future of everything, and they're telling us that we are worthless. Pat Buchanan is writing in the papers after Donald Trump put out his full-page ads, and he's saying, well, let's just take the eldest one, Corey Wise. Let's just take him and hang him from a tree in Central Park. He wrote this in the papers. Let's take the others and strip them naked and horsewhip them. Maybe this will make the city's park again. Letters like this, what they indicate is a reality in thought, where Donald Trump was trying to go, it was almost as if with those full-page ads, he was whispering to people in the darkest enclaves of society to do to us what they had done to Emmett Till. And I specifically mention him because Emmett Till, as we all know, just recently his accuser said she made the whole story up. As a matter of fact, there's footage from the trial where the accusers who were accused of murdering Emmett Till they were, they, were, they were videotaping the jurors. And in videotaping the jurors, one of them said something to the effect, um, what took so long for you to get a, a, a not guilty verdict? And the jurors said, uh, well, we just had to take a soda pop break just to make it appear that we was doing our job. We knew we was going to vote not guilty, but we needed to just take a little bit of time. Now, I submit to you, was if, if Emmett Till if he had whistled at a woman, was his murder justified? I mean, they drug him from his home. They beat him to death, shot him in the head. That's my alert to let me know that I got to pick up my children. <laughs> well, not to, <laughs> it's not going to happen today. Exactly. But they, they shot him in the head, and then they, to, to add insult to injury, they tied a cotton gin around his neck and place him in the bottom of the river. You, you have a quote on your website from Maya Angelou, be angry, but don't be bitter, yes. right? Bitter, bitter yes. is corrosive, it's a cancer, it'll eat away with you. So let's talk about some of the ways in which you're channeling your anger. How are you, how are you putting it to use? You know, when I read that quote from Dr. Maya Angelou, I was so impressed because she gave us a direction. She said, so use that anger, you write it, you dance it, you march it, you vote it, you vote it, you vote it. I'm echoing that three times because we know that it's important that we look at these elections. But then she said, you talk it. 
never stop talking it. I found tremendous healing in being able to own my story and being able to take my story and tell people what it's all about, to be able to articulate myself so that when people hear me, they're like, you went to prison? How dare they? Because see, what they're witnessing is the absolute genius of us as a people, the comeback power that we have, as my mentor Les Brown usually says, that when you fall in life, try to land on your back. Because if you can look up, you can get up. And I mean, I think that that's the reality of it, right? Being able to be resilient, being able to take life's lemons and not only make lemonade, but it'd be cool if you were juggling those lemons at the same time. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and that, and that right there, I think, is the, is the testament of where we are and how we should be. If the whole world is telling you, especially young people, if the whole world is telling young people that you're not worth nothing, then young people are gonna be walking in their reality as if they're worthless, when the reality is that they're worth everything. And so one of the things that I try to do in channeling my anger, channeling my bitterness, is I try to bend reality and deposit seeds in the minds of young people so that they know that they too can be great. They know that they too don't have to live uh, asking permission that they don't have to be confused about what they see in their reality, that the matrix is real, that they too can become like a Neo, right? And I say that because once you free yourself, like when I was in prison, I was able to free myself. I was able to start visualizing myself stepping out of that door. What would it be like if I, after I came through this horrific time and showed back up in the world? How am I gonna show up? And I decided that I wanted to be a positive force for change. Well, how, how long did it take you to, to, to get there, to get to this enlightenment? Oh man, so six months into my prison bid, literally six months into my prison bid, I wrote it in my book, Words of a Man, My Right to Be. It's the 17th poem. A man comes up to me named Jerome Jones, I'll never forget him. And he says simply, who are you? And I said, I'm Yusuf Salam, one of the guys that they uh, accused of raping a Central Park jogger, but I didn't do it. And he said, I know that, I've been watching you. You're not supposed to be here, why are you here? And it, and it threw me for a loop that I didn't even know who I was. And so in my book I say, searching to find who has come, a beautiful soul, a powerful one. It caused me to go into this philosophical journey to try to really figure out what is my name? Like what does my name mean? I found out that I was named on the seventh day of my birth. After, after, after I came out, I was named on the seventh day. I found out that the significance of all of our births, all of our realities is that we, when our mother and our father got together to create us, whether they knew it or not, we were one of over 400 million options racing to that one egg. And we are the ones that made it. And so now here it is, my parents are observing me. They're trying to figure out, who is this? Who can we tell the people who this is? And so on the seventh day, they were able to come and call the people to what they call an akika, a baby naming ceremony. And when they did that, they revealed that my name was Yusuf Idris Fahadil Abdus Salam. Now that sounds like a lot, but the meaning is even more, more profound. The meaning I found was that Yusuf means God will increase. Idris means the teacher. Fadil means with justice. And of course, everyone knows Salam means peace. But imagine my, my surprise and shock as I'm going through this tremendously, devastatingly seeming journey of prison to find out that that's what my name means. It is as if I was being shaped and formed and built and prepared for this very moment right now. 30 years later, to be able to step back into the world as a force of good, as a positive being, being able to share this journey to tell people you can go through this. You don't have to become a criminal. You don't have to become the worst that they think of you. You can become the best that you think of yourself. So, so you're, you're living your name now. You're, you're speaking. You're a poet. Yes. You've got 10 kids at home who evidently are waiting for the <laughs> ride right now. Uh, but you know, you're, some people you're, said I was making up for lost time. <laughs> but you're, yeah, yeah. 
But you're, you're also an activist, and you're campaigning yes. for criminal justice reform. So can we spend a few minutes on what specifically we need to do to make sure that a situation like the one that happened in 1989, and really, which unleashed a wave of, of legislation around the country, super predators, lowering the age of criminal yeah. adult convictions, uh, lengthening uh, convictions, what, we, what kind of laws we need to pass now to make sure it doesn't happen again? Well, see, one, one of the things that I submit is this. Many of these laws that you speak about came about as a result of the prosecution of the Central Park Five, right? They never went back when they found out that we were innocent to change those laws. Those laws were still on the books. Those laws were created because of what they called us. They said that we were wolf packs. They said that we were wilding. They created all of these terms in order to seize the fears of the public. And then they lied to the main victim and told her that they got the people who did this. And that lie is still vibrating throughout the world. She still is thinking that we had something to do with this crime. Have you ever talked to her? I've never spoken with her. We always said that the door is open, but you know, when you think about DNA, you're talking about, and I, don't, I don't usually like to say DNA, I like to use the big word so that people can say, what's that? I like to say dioxyribonucleic acid. And I say that term because I want people to know that that's your individual fingerprint that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt whether you have been there or have not. And so in this reality, especially when it comes to being faced with the criminal justice system, I remember when this night happened where they, where they came and got me. I knew that they were looking for me. And I was with Corey, and I knew Corey didn't do anything. He knew I didn't do anything because we knew each other. And so I said to Corey, I said, man, listen, man, I'm gonna just go, to, go downtown and tell the cops that I didn't do it. Man, I'll be home before my mom gets back. I came home seven years later. Even though my mother came and said, stop this madness, I still went to jail. Corey Wise wasn't even a suspect. He came with you to the police station. He came with became me, one but, of the five. but check this out. I mean, Corey is the most loyal, powerfully beautiful type of friend you would ever want. And I say that because Corey became the magic that freed us. Those of us who have seen this, this series, all throughout you'll see Corey being faced with going to parole, being, being asked, hey, are you ready to admit your guilt in this crime? And he could have at any moment buckled under the pressure and said, you know what? I gotta get out of this hell. This is torture. This is beyond torture. But he said, I didn't do that. And he kept on saying that. And finally, the magic happened. He meets the real perpetrator of the crime. Now, you asked me about actions. Part of the actions is don't go to the cops and speak to them without, and <laughs> like your mama or your father or some type of authority figure that knows the law, right? Because we see that even in the case, we have Antron's father who Antron is still dealing with the, the heartache and pain of what his father had caused to happen to him, right? But Antron's father didn't know the law. Many of our parents didn't know the law. I mean, if you think about it, on the Miranda card, which they had me sign, I actually signed that Miranda card. They never read it to me. They never said anything about it. They just said, he signed this card. It says, you have the right to remain silent. Now, if you don't remain silent, what happens? Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Not they might, you, no, can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. And they then tell you, only guilty people need attorneys. You can talk to us. You need to protect yourself before you wreck yourself, right? That's what I grew up on, that type of hip hop, where there was a message in the music and there was music in the message. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that's important. I mean, just these simple kinds of things, the, the, the series, When They See Us, the doc, the Central Park Five, the book, the Central Park Five, a chronicle of a city wilding, are all tools that young people and people in general can use and put in their toolkits in order to navigate what I call treacherous waters. I want to someday be able to call it the criminal justice system. Because all throughout the nation on the side of cop cars, you have these words, 
courtesy, professionalism, and respect. Right? I'm sorry, you have these words, to serve and protect on the side of cop cars. In New York City, it goes a step further. In addition to that, it says courtesy, professionalism, and respect. But if your name happened to have been, at that moment, Eric Garner, as the whole nation watched him get his life taken away from him, he kept saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. In New York City, where the cop cars say courtesy, professionalism, and respect, they didn't even give him the first letters off of those words. Yousef, there are a lot of powerful people in this room. Mm. What can they do to propagate this message? I think shedding awareness about individual stories. Even, even in your power, even in your privilege, there are moments that we all know you could be driving while black. You could be walking while black. You could be barbecuing while black. You could be cutting your own grass while black. I mean, these realities face all of us and at the end of the day, bringing awareness on a global platform of power and prestige can do a lot to shift things, to budge, to move that needle. I think even with this series, one of the greatest things that I've experienced is the outpouring of love and support around the globe. I mean, people are writing me and, and tweeting us and sharing messages in their own language, and sometimes you don't have a Google Translate button. But all you know is that they're telling you that they love you because you see hearts at the end of it, or you see the, the strong person at the end of it, or something like that. And I can't do anything but just say, wow. You've come they a long way from it. that letter. Yeah, they meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Last yeah. question to end on an upbeat note. Uh, yesterday, some of you may have seen in Variety, an exclusive, Yusuf Salam signs with CAA. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean, and what's next for you? I think it's about a global takeover. I think it's about utilizing perhaps the most powerful mechanism like CAA to magnify your voice and to magnify the voice of the voiceless. To not look at it as a celebrity thing or anything like that, but to really look at it as being able to use your voice as a positive presence and a positive force in the world. And perhaps even uh, fulfill the footsteps of uh, of a Nelson Mandela. Do you see yourself getting involved in politics? I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about what best is the way that I can position myself that everybody can benefit. Because if I realize that I was born on purpose and with a purpose, then I don't necessarily want to just stay in one space. Right? The Central Park Jogger case vibrated around the world. When they see us, and now the exonerated five are rippling around the globe in such a tremendous way that even though the, they said 23 million And uh, it's just views, the beginning. Right? Now check this out. This is crazy, because I was talking to some folks in my community. They said, come on, Yousef, you know we share accounts. I said, so then you mean that might be like 23 million times two? They said, no, up. Times three, up. They said, we may have shared accounts with each other, and it might be times 10 or more. That's how people are affected by this. And to see young people come to me, I was at my daughter's graduation the other day, and they're supposed to be taking photos of the graduates, but they're coming up to me crying, wanting to embrace me, saying, man, you changed my life. Young, young boys crying looking at me, and all I have to do is try to figure out how can I impart a word to this young person that I want them to know that if they ever find themselves in so-called dark places, there's always a light somewhere in the darkness. And even if that light is inside you, you can illuminate your own darkness and shine your light on the world. Yousef, I, I want to thank you for helping us end this conference on such a profound note. Can we please have a round of applause?